بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم we decided we're going to do a, a topic of dealing with doubts that means in my language suočavanje sa sa uh, dvomicama sumnjama uh, so ah i i i explained at the beginning before you came in that everyone is dealing with doubts either in marriage either in life in general uh, you know when i when i uh, receive a dish that my missus Uh, prepared I, i'm doubting did she put enough salt in so doubts are qu- quite quite you know <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> doubting in life is quite normal so we shouldn't be surprised if we are having doubts in everything in life around it us it can be very dangerous could be very dangerous yes. yeah. just don't tell your missus that you're doubting you know so yeah. you know. but so so I, i kind of explain the doubting is 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 quite quite natural but so he shouldn't be surprised if someone has doubts and and so on and then i kind of flipped the topic because me and and Davor, of course we had doubts in christianity and uh, that's why we accepted islam but hamdra now you are here so maybe we we could we could start dealing dealing with the topic instead of with our experiences so jazakallah my dear brothers so in terms of the topic of doubts we have to be very clear that this has a particular Arabic term in the Islamic tradition it's called shubuhat which is the plural for shubha now a doubt doesn't mean just having a question and that's why i like to translate shubuhat as destructive doubts what are destructive doubts destructive doubts are doubts that seek and aim to undermine the foundations of Islam and they want to distort the religion not only do they seek to do this but they come from a psychological space so when you're asking the question or you're when you're presenting a position or when you're express, expressing your doubts you already believe that the foundations of islam are questionable questionable and you believe in a distortion of the religion this is what a shubha is okay so as i was saying a shubha and the plural for a shubha is shubuhat is best translated as destructive doubts and it's the type of doubts that seek to undermine the religion the foundations of the religion and they seek to distort the religion of Islam and the person expressing that doubt or having that doubt actually is undermining the foundations of the religion in some way and is trying to believe in a distorted version of the religion this is what a shubha is and interestingly a shubha tushbihu meaning it 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 resembles something that it's not in other words a shubha a destructive doubt is falsehood dressed up as truth it's a wolf in sheep's clothing it's falsehood dressed up as truth and as ibn taymiyah the 14th century scholar may Allah have mercy on him he mentions that there's an element of truth in a shubha it's not true its foundations are not true but there is a little sprinkling on an element that's why some people have taken it seriously that's why human beings have fallen for the trap because it tries to resemble truth but it's not truth tushbihu it resembles something that it's not it's a wolf in sheep's clothing so destructive doubt just to repeat is a doubt that comes from a psychological space and in and a, and a mental space if you like that seeks to undermine the foundations of the religion and wants to distort the religion and the one expressing that doubt or having that doubt they actually start to attach themselves to the distortion of the religion and and they start to believe that there is something wrong <laughs> about the foundations of the religion is that clear so far yes barakalafik so when we move on from this ikhwan we have to understand now that the way to empower people concerning shubuhat is first and foremost to be able to make a distinction between a shubha a waswasa and a valid doubt or question this is so important 
making distinctions, the ability to distinguish between one thing and another is empowering. Let me give an example. If I go to a forest in Serbia and I'm in a forest in Serbia and I see different berries, for me, because I have no distinctions, I don't have the knowledge, I think they're all berries. And I'm going to start choosing any berry I want. And then what happens? I get poisoned or I die because I picked the wrong type of berry. I, cause, and the reason I picked the wrong type of berry is because I wasn't able to make distinctions. However, if we rewind this and I go back into the forest and I could make the distinction between the berries that are good for me, that are nutritious, the berries that are poisonous, and the berries that may uh, make me feel sick and die, if I can make the distinction between the different type of berries, I'm empowered. Likewise, when it comes to shubuhat, a shubha, waswasa, and valid doubts or questions, we have to know and make distinctions. Know what makes them different because sometimes shaitan whispers to us because we don't know how to make the distinctions. We think a waswasa is a shubha. And we think a shubha is a valid question and it's all put together and we get so confused and we think, you know, you know, maybe we're not Muslim or we don't uh, believe in Islam. And, you know, shaitan uses that to cr make us crumble. So the first thing we have to do is to make a distinction. And the best way to make a distinction is to understand what the dean says about these three things. So we already defined what a shubha is. It's a destructive doubt. It comes from a psychological and mental space where you undermine the foundations of the religion. You distort the religion and you, you, you actually start to believe in that. Now, a waswasa is different. Generally speaking, waswasa or shaitanic whisperings are actually a sign of iman in general. For example, the Sahaba had... Waswasa, there were some ideas or fleeting thoughts, and they didn't believe in them and they hated them based on the hadith of the of the Prophet. And the Prophet asked them, you know, is this how you react? Is this your kind of state? And he said, This is a sign of Iman. So they knew that the fleeting thoughts or the waswasa had no foundation, they knew it was wrong. They did not attach to it. They didn't believe in it. And they had a negative psychological response. They had an aversion to that waswasa. And according to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as long as they don't speak about it and don't act upon it, then that's the way forward. So we know if we have a fleeting thought or a waswasa about the deen, and our reaction is, I know it's not true. And our reaction is, I hate it. And you don't talk about it, you don't act upon it. This is a sign of Iman. So this should increase your Iman because the Prophet ﷺ said, when you're in that state, when you have fleeting thoughts or waswasa, and you don't like them, you don't believe in them, and you have an aversion to them, and you don't act upon them or don't speak about them, this is a, this is a sign of Iman. And if the Prophet ﷺ is telling us, this is a sign of Iman, then it should increase our Iman. The other point is, what's a valid doubt or a valid question? Well, really, anything goes. As long, as long as the you don't believe in the distortion of the religion, a distortion of the religion, and you don't attempt or you don't start to believe in the, in the distortion of of the foundations of the religion, or you believe there's something inaccurate or false about the foundations. Let me give an example. I may have a valid doubt or question about God's existence. I might say, Sheikh, how do I prove God's existence? Do I need to prove God's existence? Now that sounds like a question or a doubt, but we have to find out what's happening in the person's heart and mind. They may have full yaqeen in the existence of Allah, they just don't know how to prove God's existence. So there's a difference here. They're not undermining the foundation. They don't question God's existence like, oh, I'm not sure. They're not doing that. They're not distorting the religion. 
They're just basically saying, I have full conviction, yaqeen, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I just don't know how to prove his existence. Or I want to ask the question, do I have to know? That's a different psychological and spiritual space. You're coming from a space where you believe in Allah, you have full conviction, your fitrah is awakened, you have full conviction, but you're just questioning in that context, how do I prove God's existence? I already know Allah exists. I just want to learn how to prove Allah's existence. And it could be uh, different types of questions. Now, obviously, there are some questions we can't uh, ask. For example, we can't ask questions about the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this is the teaching of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We don't focus on Allah's essence. We focus on the manifestation, the expression of his names and attributes. And we can never even think about Allah's essence because who are we? We have limited cognitive faculties. We have limited abilities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is transcendent. He's all-powerful, all-knowing. We, we don't even have the ability to start to think about these things. So some questions are even are invalid questions because of the person or the reality of the person who's asking the question. If Allah has the totality of knowledge and wisdom, he's al-alim, al-hakim, his wisdom and knowledge are to the highest degree possible, they are perfect, and he has the picture, and we just have a pixel, how could we even start to think about the wisdom and knowledge of Allah in terms of its maximal perfection? Imagine now trying to think about his essence. It's an irrational point. There is no starting point. This is why we don't talk about the essence of Allah. We ask questions about Allah's names and attributes, how to know Allah this way. And then the more you know Allah, the more you love Allah. So just in, as a summary, if I may, just if I if I may, yeah. sorry, Akhi, if course. I may interrupt you for for the last point, I would just add one small thing. You, you literally need to know your place. You need to put yourself in a place where you are. You need to understand you are a creation of Allah. You are not a creator. And so that that's as simple as that. If you have that, in you, then then this 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 second point is pretty much done. And on the first point, I would I would like to give one example when when you have a wasawas and you don't act upon it. That we definitely all of us had. You're in Salah, Allah Akbar, and you remember, aha, uh -huh, I left my keys there. Are you going to go and pick them up? <laughs> so, so you have a what's the what's the say, okay, thank you for telling me, and you continue, continue with your with your Salah. So just, just want to add a little bit of herbs to your to your speech. Make it Jazak wa -hai. Jazak wa -hai. So make, making a distinction, understanding the difference between a shubha or shubuhat, waswasa, and a valid question or a valid concern or doubt is extremely important because it empowers us. Now, what I'm saying now, Akhi, we should have a discussion because this is a very important point now. Before we even discuss the nature of shubuhat, before we go into how to address shubuhat, we have to understand what is a human being. Wallahi, this is so important because sometimes in the modern Tao, we forget all about this. We think a human being is like a computer. We type in an algorithm, some code, and we're going to expect some results. This is a terrible and terrifying view of the human. This is not even in line with modern psychology. We need to understand the human being because a shubha affects the human being. If we don't know who the human being is, from an Islamic psychological point of view, then how we are going to know the effect of shubuhat and how we're going to be able to address shubuhat. We would not have a comprehensive set of strategies to deal with destructive doubts. So it's very important for us to focus a little bit on, well, what is the human being? Who is the human being? And the way to answer this, we go to Quran and Sunnah. We don't go to some, you know, materialist or naturalist that believes that the human being is just a bunch of neurons firing and that's it. No, the human being is obviously a body, but also has a qalb, has an aql, has a ruh, has a nafs, has a fitra. And all of these things are dynamic interplay. 
And let's focus on the issue of the qalb. The qalb, brothers, which is very important to understand, is quite central to the human being. And the qalb has many functions. For example, one of the functions of the qalb is actually the aql. The major, many of the ulama, the Habibi. majority of the ulama sorry, discuss. Habibi. Yeah, sorry. So, sorry, Habibi, because we may have some non Muslims watching us, and when you say qalb, heart, aql, the, the, the intellect, if you don't mind, once you explain, just to, to throw the English word yeah, here and sure. there. So, so uh, the qalb in the Islamic tradition is loosely translated as the heart. But the heart, the qalb in the Islamic tradition has many functions such as the aql, which is also the intellect. So the intellect is a function of the heart, the function of the qalb. But what does the qalb do? So this, this is interesting. So in Arabic, the qalb does qalaba, qalaba, qalb, taqallub. It does taqallub. It's always, the heart is always wavering. And in Islam, for us to be safe on the day of judgment, we have to come to Allah with a sound heart. It's fixed on iman, on faith, on, on, on the belief in Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the heart does taqallub. Not only that, the heart gets diseased. It gets diseased. And according to Ibn Qayyum, the 14th century scholar, the, the student of Ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy on both of them, he mentioned there are four main spiritual diseases. Yes, there are other diseases that come from these diseases, but there are four main spiritual diseases. Number one, kibr, arrogance. Number two, hasad, blameworthy jealousy. Number three, riya, ostentation, showing off. Number four, ujub. Vanity, self-amazement. You think you're the source of your success and it's all about you. And if the heart gets diseased, the aql, the intellect, is a function of the heart. So even if you know all the arguments for Islam, even if you know all the intellectual stuff and you have all the information, if the aql is a function, if the intellect is a function of the qalb, the heart, and the heart is diseased, then the aql will not function properly or it would not it would not be used in the correct way. This is so important to understand because the issue of shubuhat, the issue of a shubha, a destructive doubt, is an issue of the qalb. The shubha comes to the heart it may rest on the heart, if you want to use that metaphor, or it may infect the heart like a parasite and drain your iman. So when it comes to shubuhat, it's not only an intellectual issue. And we see this in our experiences, my dear brothers and sisters. We have, for example, Lighthouse Mentoring Service, where we give hours and hours a week for free, one-to-one, -one, dealing with people who want to get involved in the dawah or deal with shubuhat. I would say, roughly speaking from my experience, 75% of the people who have shubuhat or the people who leave Islam, even if they came with an intellectual question, after a conversation, after discussion and analysis, it was an emotional or spiritual issue. I give an example. Someone came up to me, a Pakistani quantum physicist came up to me when I finished a lecture once. He said, Hamza, I'm an atheist. Or he's an apostate. He said, your argument for God's existence doesn't make sense because causality, cause and effect, doesn't make sense outside of the universe. Now, obviously, I've studied philosophy in Western academia. At that time, fine, I wasn't in academia, but I still studied it. I could have started questioning about, well, I can show to you that your assumption of that causality is wrong. You're assuming it's derived from experience, but I can show you you need causality before you understand experience and you need it to even understand experiences. I could have given him a, given him a Kantian example, but no. We need to understand that human beings are not just intellectual machines. We're emotional, psycho-spiritual uh, uh, beings. 
And I felt to myself, he didn't need that. He needed something else. So I asked him a question. I said, what do you mean about causality? Because if you study Western philosophy, yes, they accept cause and effect, but the link between the cause and effect, the causal link, there's ikhtilaf. And in Western philosophy, this is called metaphysics. In metaphysics, there's a domain of knowledge concerning causality or sub-domain of knowledge concerning the nature of the causal link. Anyway, not to complicate things, but I said to him, what do you mean by causality? And to cut a long story short, he said to me, I don't know. And I said, hold on a second. You're using a key word in a sentence to deny Allah and you don't even know what that word means? And then I realized his issue wasn't an intellectual issue. It, it was something else. So I was tried to be nice to him. We sat down. We walked a bit. We sat down and we had a conversation. And he basically said to me, look, my main problem is that I came from a secular family. I did not know how to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, I have so many of these examples in my experience. Even when people come with so-called intellectual stuff, when you have a deep, beautiful, sincere conversation with them, I think around 75% is to do with psycho-emotive issues, trauma because of parenting, and so on and so forth. Now, before we move on, it's something very important to, to, to now bring to the discussion. We mentioned the qalb and the aql, but we also should mention the fitra. The, the fitra is very important. This means the original normative disposition or the innate disposition, the natural disposition. And there are two main opinions in the Islamic tradition. One opinion is that the fitra, the innate disposition, doesn't have any knowledge. It's like a blank slate, but it's like a car. It's a vehicle that is driving towards the haq. But because of the hadith in Sahih Muslim, the prophetic, authentic narration narrated by Muslim that says that the Prophet ﷺ said every child is born in this state, but basically his parents change him. That's the meaning of the hadith. Now, and what happens to the car, the, in, the, dis, the innate natural disposition of the car, and it's a good metaphor to use, it could get clouded. So the, the fitra, the innate disposition cannot drive towards the truth. Our job as Muslims is to help people uncloud their fitra so it drives itself towards the truth. The way to uncloud the fitra is not only using rational arguments. You could use a combination of rational arguments, giving them revelation, the Quran, being a good person, and so on and so forth. You could use any of these, and there's many more ways to uncloud the fitra, or you could use them in combination. The other opinion is that the fitra has some type of knowledge, call it primary knowledge, that God is worthy of worship, extensive praise, and that he exists. But the fitra, the innate disposition gets clouded. And similar to the first opinion, our job is to help uncloud the fitra to awaken the truth that's already within people. The reason this is important at this stage of our discussion, because it contextualizes the way I spoke to that Pakistani atheist, or, or apostate, because I start to realize that every human being has a fitra, and they already know, or, or the fitra has the capacity to know, and is driving towards the truth, but the fitra is clouded. And I felt that, just from experience, that his fitra is not clouded because of any intellectual arguments. There's something else going on. Once we appreciate this about the human being, and Allah told us through revelation that this is the human being, and Allah knows the human being better than, than the human being knows the human being. Once we understand this about the, the human being, what we mentioned earlier about the qalb and the aql and the fitra, it allows us to be more mature when we're discussing with people. Because not every discussion requires an argument, even if they come with an intellectual question. We have to be sensitive to their context because the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is to individualize the person to understand where they're coming from. And we have to give the right medicine, the right tools uh, for the right job, the right medicine for the right sickness. And sometimes people need something else other than an intellectual argument. So I, I wanted to bring the fitra in here because I thought it was very important 
at this stage of our discussion. So in summary, at this stage, brothers and sisters, we know what shubha is, we know what waswasa are, we know what a valid question or doubt is. We've understood how this makes sense in the context of the qalb and the aql and the fitrah. So now we're ready to start to talk about the certain strategies on how to do with shubhat. And there are at least 10 effective strategies on how to do with shubhat. One of them we already mentioned, which was making a distinction between waswasa shubhat and valid questions or doubts. And we, 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 I mentioned that in the beginning because I thought it was very important, but that's a strategy in itself. In order for us to be protected from shubhat, we have to know what, were they, what they are, and we should not confuse them with, with waswasa and valid questions. Another strategy is to avoid them. Another strategy is to be aware of them. Another strategy is to seek ilm, knowledge, because knowledge would always obliterate doubts. Another strategy is to have the right environment. You are a product of your environment. And we could refer to social psychology and even from the Quran and the Sunnah about these issues. Another strategy is to focus on your qalb. How do you strengthen the qalb, the heart? Praying to Allah, doing your dhikr, your afkar, your du'as in the morning and the evening, recitation of the Quran, tadabbur of the Quran, tahajjud prayer, and so on and so forth. Another strategy is to make du'a. Another strategy is to ask a specialist. Because we, we can't answer all the questions we have to sometimes ask others. Allah says, ask the people of remembrance. Ask those who know. And we have specialists in our community. So there are amazing strategies that we could talk about. And I truly believe if we are sincere and we follow these strategies, it would annihilate any shubha that we have. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Well, 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 we have competition. Wa alaikum Aris. Now we have competition. Yes, uh, Who's I'm, better I'm, looking? Definitely, Iris is better looking. Mashallah, tabarakallah. Oh, I'm I'm younger in age, so that's that's the reason why. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, good. Good to hear from you. He, he, uh, yeah, brother Iris yeah. uh, lives in in Greece at the moment. He's the only Muslim in his town. Him and, oh, and really? his sisters, Mashallah, they are the oh, only Muslims yeah. there. Iris, Abu Boy say. Είμαι από το από τη, μένω στη Κέρκυρα, καταγωγή μου είναι από την Κρήτη και oh, really? είμαι στη Σερβία, wow. οπότε είναι <laughs> wow. so, crazy. Yeah? You, 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 so you live in uh, Κέρκυρα, it's Kofu, uh, but you're from Crete yeah. and you were born in Serbia. Yeah, my origin is from Crete and I'm born yes. in Serbia and I'm currently living in Corfu, yeah. Wow, that's, that's, brilliant. So wherever I'm wherever I am, there is there is a few Muslims around. So not you know very, the, 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 the Cretans have a the Cretans have a very good um they have a very good uh reputation of being very strong. Um they yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah they were given I think even Churchill he spoke about the Greeks, but he was talking about the Cretans, I think, because when the Germans came Everyone in Crete had a gun, yeah, even the children had guns. And they and they they uh, stalled the Germans from going into Africa, I believe. And I think that's when the famous yeah, statement that's, was that's true. Yeah, if you uh you be be afraid with a man who has a gun, but be even more afraid a Greek with a knife, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. Uh, and it's still like that, like in Crete, uh, the, 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 every, every house has, has a weapon, you know, like it's in their, wow, their mentality. Wow. It's very different from other parts of Greece. Sure. Like the other parts of Greece are like towards the West and the West culture. But uh, in Crete, you have that strong families. So, you know, like um, yeah, closer to big... the religion, closer yeah, to, the, to, the, to the moral. Sure. There's, there's, a, there's a famous uh, Greek writer called Nikos uh, Kandanzakis, who, wrote, who was from Crete as well. He wrote some very fascinating books. Yeah. He, he, even tra he even traveled to the Middle East as well. Uh, so how is the Islam in Crete, in, in Kerkira? In Kerkira and Corfu, unfortunately, there is there is no, no mosque, there is no, no Muslim. So, like, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm only one here my, my wife thanks to God and we she's out as well the beginner learning about the religion trying to 
to incorporate some rules of, of Islam in their life in uh, in their life. But you know, like it's, it's, um, mentality is here very different, and you know the people are very very um, concentrated on the Christianity, and they have that, that rivalry with the Turkey. And you, you can explain, you know, you can speak to the people like. So it's very hard to do the dawah here, and uh, yeah, may, we will try. We are, I will give my best, but I, I, I'm now still concentrated to speaking to people uh, in Serbia because I, I grew up there, so I have yeah. many, many friends, and yeah, I can um, I can do better job uh, on on that field now, right now. And here in Greece is difficult. I tried, but yeah, there is uh, still uh, we, we should keep trying. Yeah, that, that's that's the thing. So yeah. basically, here in Corfu is a situation that there is no mask, there is no such a thing that you can speak about Islam, that you can go and do dawah, and like it's no no understanding for that in, in Greece in general. But it's all a taboo, like the, the taboo. But I, I know one synagogue. There is one synagogue here, so I'm I'm, I'm going there sometimes, speaking with the, with the rabbis, and uh, because uh, in this discussion with the Christians, we have a lot of. Um, uh, we have to deal with some uh, Hebrew words and the Hebrew understanding of the Bible, so which is very important for me to know better, to understand their perspective. And for me, I found it very useful uh, because I can contact them and speak a little bit to them. That's the best I can do it from this this, this position. So uh, um, that's about me. I know you very well. I'm watching your your your. YouTube channel, uh, watching your videos, it's uh, amazing stuff. Uh, I, I pray to God to give you the best on both worlds. I mean, I'm very happy, and it's uh, my pleasure to be here uh, on the same on the same channel with you. So, I have here one question for you from, from one of the uh, uh, from the audience. So, um, I will try to translate it to you as as best as uh, I can. So the okay, let me read first. So uh, basically, the question is why the most majority of the people on the earth did not receive the clear message of Islam, so they are prejudged to go to the Jahannam. And here I I see that like because the most of the world are like Hindu or or, or, or Orthodox or Catholics, and uh, this guy assuming that uh, basically this is the sorry the woman, she is assuming that the God did not um, provide the just revelation to all nations in some way, and because of this predisposition, somebody who is born in maybe Hindu or I don't know where uh, that this thing that is um, very hard to to get the the, 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 the meaning the, the, the clear understanding of Islam so how those people uh, how is that right from the God towards those people so that is somehow the yes. my it's, it, yeah roughly, it's a very, roughly translation of the question yeah it's a very good question but the question has a false assumption because the assumption of the question is that God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has not given everyone a fair chance just because they were born in a country or in a situation where they didn't receive Islam. This is false on a few points, and let me explain why. Number one, when we look at Allah's names and attributes, Allah subhanahu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the just, He is the fair, and he is also the intensely merciful, and he is al-wadud, he is the loving. When you study the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you study the tawheed of Allah, you realize that his names and attributes are perfect to the highest degree possible. This is called maximal perfection. And they have no deficiency and no flaw. And Allah is transcendent. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ so when we think about Allah's justice and His mercy, nothing, no one, nothing in your imagination can even compare to the perfect justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the perfect mercy of Allah. Nothing you can imagine. 
So whether we understand the full reality of what's happening socially around the world and Dawa, this is only from our own limited perspective. But we know because Allah is the most just, He is the most merciful and the most loving, and He is the most fair, then justice will manifest itself. And this is interesting because one of the famous scholars of Islam, Sufyan al thawri he said something on the line, along the lines of, if I had to choose between my mother and Allah to judge me on the day of judgment, I would choose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he knew Allah's justice and mercy and love is, is not even comparable to a human being. Laysa kimithlihi shay. To even to compare it would be committing shirk. Allah's names and attributes are maximally perfect without any deficiency of flaw. So one of the false assumptions, an element of the false assumption here is that Allah is not going to be just. But we know because He is the most just, His justice will manifest itself. And so whoever goes to Jannah, Jahannam, no one could have made a better decision because Allah is the most perfect being his names and attributes are perfect. That's the first point. So we can't use our limited understanding of anthropology or sociology of what's happening in the world to try and think, oh, because I can't understand why all of these people are Hindu now and you know, I, I, it's most likely they're never going to be Muslim, therefore they're going to Jahannam, therefore Allah is unjust. That is a very silly, li limited way of seeing the world because you're seeing it from only your perspective. Allah has the picture, we just got the pixel. And as I said, Allah is perfectly loving and just and no one is going to escape, no one can escape the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the first point. The second point is, you're also assuming that they have received the message or they haven't received the message and you're assuming what's going to happen to them. And this is very important to understand because in the Islamic tradition, when you look at the works of Ibn Taymiyyah, you look at the works of Al-Ghazali, they had these discussions concerning people who did not receive the message of Islam, what's going to happen to them. So a group of scholars said, if they didn't receive the message, there's nothing to reject. And Allah in the Quran, he describes people of hellfire, according to this group of scholars, those who reject Islam, reject the truth. There is another group of scholars, they have a similar view, but they base it on the authentic hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, when he talks about the four non-Muslims who die as non-Muslim, but they get tested in the Akhirah. And they go to paradise. And one of them include those between messengers, those who can hear the message, though the one who I think who was uh, majnoon, uh, uh, crazy or mentally not well, and the one who was too old to understand the message. Double check uh, the categories, but there were four categories. And the hadith explains that they will be tested on the day of judgment. And if they pass the test, then they go to paradise. So these two views of, of the scholars basically indicates very strongly to us that Allah will not be unjust to anyone. We know this because of Tawheed, because of Allah's names and attributes as we just discussed. But we also know it theologically from a scriptural perspective in terms of its specifics because number one, uh, there, there's a group of people who haven't received Islam, so they cannot reject it. Therefore, uh, something else happens to them. And this is explained further in the authentic hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the four types of non-Muslims that die as non-Muslim, but uh, go to paradise because they get tested in the Akhirah. And that's another authentic view. And this echoes the view of Ibn Taymiyyah and Al-Ghazali as well. Al-Ghazali has an interesting take on the Byzantines, I believe. I think he mentions the Byzantines. And he says, look, all they know is negativity about the Prophet All they know is like, you know, inverted commas, Islamophobia, yeah, about uh, Islam. They know that they know the lies and the distortions. So they haven't received the message clearly. 
So there is no hujja on them. Now, obviously, there is ikhtilaf amongst the ulama on this issue, but generally speaking, what we can say very clearly, the questioner assumes that the theology of Islam doesn't have answers to her perspective, and there is answers. As I said in the beginning, Allah's justice and mercy is maximally perfect with no deficiency in flaw. Nothing is going to escape the perfect justice and mercy of Allah. So that's one point. Number two, in our theology, the groups of scholars that we just mentioned explain what may happen to, to non-Muslims who have not received the message of Islam. So it's not the simply as, oh, there's a whole group of non-Muslims and these Muslims didn't hear the message and they die on, as non-Muslims and therefore Allah throws them into the hellfire unjustly. No, this is not the tradition. This is not based on what we've just discussed concerning who Allah is and the authentic hadith of Prophet Sallam. However, What's important to do is this, is to think of it from a phenomenological perspective, your first person experience. You need to ask your question, where am I going? فَعِينَ تَتْحَبُون As Allah says in the Quran, where are you going? Focus on yourself, because the other people, the guidance of other people is not in your hands or my hands, it's in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is most just and most wise and most loving and most merciful. Leave it to Allah. When we can't do Allah's job, right? Because we're limited creatures. Allah is boundless. Allah is all-powerful, perfect, knowing the creator of the heavens and the earth. Allah knows what He's doing. He, nothing's going to escape His, perf His perf perfect justice and mercy and wisdom. Leave it to Allah. What we need to focus on, where are we going in our lives? And also, are we sharing the beauty of Islam to other people? Because Allah tells us to share. We should be part of the solution. Let's be part of spreading that nur, that light with all human beings. As Allah says, Udu'u ila sabili rabbik. Call, udu'u, call to the way, the sabil of Allah. With hikmah, with wisdom, with ihsan, with beautiful preaching. And discuss and debate with them in ways that are best. This is what we should be doing, brothers and sisters. So hopefully I've tried to answer the question and Allah knows best. MashaAllah. Even sister, she, sister who asked, she said MashaAllah. And here she said that she's thanking you for the good answer. Allahu Akbar. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. So brothers, I don't know where you where you, uh, where you at. I just did my salah. I see that MashaAllah you, you answered the question. Um, should we do... Uh, those 10, 10 solutions and maybe some suggestions for them that, that you mentioned uh, at the end of your, your... Yes, so we can do the 10 strategies, although, uh, if and, I, and you know, I ask your permission, uh, uh, if you could access our website, you could download the book for free that goes into the 10 strategies in detail, and you can access our learning platform that is totally free, you could go through the whole course called No Doubt, which is like, I think, over 94 sessions. It's very detailed, and it goes through the strategies in detail because on this live, we won't be able to go into detail. But if you give me permission, uh, I haven't mentioned what the website is. Um, yes, please, please, I, please. Yeah. yeah, so the website is sapiensinstitute.org. S-A-P-I-E-N-C-E institute.org and if you go to the book section forward slash books you could download a book by Sheikh Fahad Taslim called No Doubt that book goes through all of the 10 strategies it's for free you guys can take it you could translate it to Serbian for free it's all yours um, and it's only about 25,000 words also, if you go to our learning platform, we have many in-depth courses. We have an in-depth course on these strategies called No Doubt. If you go to learn, L-E-A-R-N dot sapiensinstitute.org, you could register for that course. Myself and Sheikh Fahad delivered that course, alhamdulillah. So that, uh, the reason I want to mention that is because we won't have time to go into full details concerning all of the strategies. But the strategies, as we said, include, number one, making a distinction, being able to distinguish between a shubha, a waswasa, and a valid question, 
which we already discussed. The second strategy, which is very important, is to be aware that they exist. Now, you may think this is a weak strategy. No, this is extremely important because if you're not aware of something, you're most likely to get caught. Like, for example, I like to use boxing analogies. If you're a boxer and you're not aware of the right hand, which is the haymaker, the strong punch, right? If you're not aware that's coming, he hasn't telegraphed it. It's coming from a different angle. You haven't seen it, seen it come. It's going to hit you in the face and you're going to get knocked out. But if you're focused and aware and you have your guard up and you're aware that this person may throw the right hand, then it makes it much easier for you to defend against the, the punch. Similarly with Shubuhat, be aware and don't take this lightly because the best people to have walked this planet, the Anbiya, the Sahaba, they were aware of Shubuhat. The Prophet ﷺ used to have an oft-repeated dua, a supplication, and he would supplicate to Allah, Oh, turner of hearts, make my heart firm Aladinik on your deen. We see the Sahaba. One Sahabi narrates that he saw around, I think, 30 Sahaba, the best people who to have walked this planet after the Prophets, the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They were worried about nifaq, about hypocrisy. So they were aware of this disease. Also, we have the Anbiya, the Prophets themselves. Look at Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam in the Quran is making dua to Allah for Allah to protect him and his family, his family from shirk. Ibrahim alayhi salam is the destroyer of shirk. He's the destroyer of idols. But he was aware that these are spiritual realities that a shubha, a destructive doubt can come and infect your heart anytime. So if the Anbiya, the Prophets, if the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet and the best people to have walked this planet were aware of Shubahat and were wary of them, then what about us, brothers and sisters? What about us? We should not take Iman for granted. Iman, faith, is a gift from Allah. It's a priceless gift. What does Allah say in chapter 39, verse 17? So chapter 49, verse 17, he, Allah is talking to those Arabs who thought that Iman was a favor to the Prophet Sallam. What does Allah say? Say to them, basically, that Iman is a favor from Allah. Our faith, our Iman is not something we've earned. It's a gift. It's a priceless gift from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. We have to protect that gift. And we have to be aware that the best people placed on this planet who challenged polytheism and shirk and falsehood were aware that shubahat exists and that they can infect the heart and they took mechanisms like making dua to protect themselves from this. So that's the second strategy, be aware. By the way, these strategies are not a roadmap. You don't start from one and end on the last one. It's a toolkit. You use each of them or in combination depending on your context. The third strategy, brothers and sisters, is, is to avoid. Because what we mentioned earlier concerning the qalb, it does taqallub, and we talked about the fitra and the nature of the human being and the nature of shubuhat, tushbihu, it resembles something that it's not. It's a wolf in sheep's clothing. It is a, a it's true, it's, it's a falsehood dressed up as truth. Because of all of these things, we need to now realize that we could have weakness in our heart. And because of the weakness in our heart, if we know that if we go on this YouTube channel or we read this book or we go to this area where it, it, there's going to be shubuhat, then we should, because we know the nature of the human, the nature of the human being is weak, we need to avoid them. And we see this in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ about the hadith of the Dajjal. When Allah, when the Prophet says to basically run away, don't think that you're going to deal with the fitna of the Dajjal. Run away, avoid. So that's a very powerful strategy that we don't use all the time. We think we're Islamic superheroes. We think we have, you know, 
we've injected ourselves with some kind of, you know, Islamic spiritual testosterone and we could take all falsehood. No, it doesn't work that way. Know your place. Yeah. So avoid. The fourth strategy, brothers and sisters, it's a very important strategy, is to gain ilm, Islamic knowledge. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, when you gain ilm, you, you traverse, you travel the path of knowledge, Islamic knowledge, Quran and Sunnah, and understanding of our classical scholars, this would obliterate any doubts. And we see this with multiple examples concerning, you know, accusations against the Sharia law, accusations against so many different things. When you have ilm, you know the principles, you know what the Quran and the Sunnah say, it obliterates these doubts. Now, we have to be careful here. When we say ilm, what do we mean? We think ilm is just basically abstract memor memorization. I know this hadith, I know this ayah. No, 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 no. With all due respect, this is the crisis of the ummah at the moment. We think ilm, we think knowledge is abstract information. Brothers and sisters, how many people know ayat and hadith on dhikr, but they never become people of dhikr? Just knowing and memorizing these ayat and ha hadith does not make them become someone. Ilm in Islam, as Allah says in the Quran, increases taqwa, increases God consciousness. Ilm is not just abstract information. It should change the way you speak, change what's in your heart, and change how you behave, how you relate to others, how you relate to yourself, and how you relate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It changes your way of being. Now, we, we can't go into too much detail about this, but we have to realize that ilm is not just abstract information. As Imam Malik said, ilm, knowledge, is not just memorization. It's the light that Allah puts in your heart. It's the light that Allah puts in your heart. So, um, that's why we have to try and follow traditional ways of learning ilm as well, because there is a kind of uh, very interesting, uh, powerful mechanism in learning from ulama, scholars, because you will learn from scholars what you will never learn from a book, because you see it in the way they react and the way they interact with you. For example, you can't learn humility from a book. You learn humility through your interactions with other people. So when you gain more ilm, you're going to basically annihilate and obliterate those doubts. Number five, check your environment. You are the product of your friends and the people around you. When you look into social psychology and you look into the Quran and the Sunnah concerning your environment, you will see that your environment affects you. We know the famous hadith of Prophet Sallam. You'll be with those who you love, that you'll be upon the religion of your friends. We also know about the hadith of the blacksmith and the perfume seller. That if you hang around the blacksmith, you're going to smell of, of, of the smoke. If you hang around the perfume smeller, you're going to smell of perfume. We know this in social psychology. With the development of the social norm is based on our need to belong and our need to feel certain. This has got informational social influence and normative social influence. We know the studies of social influence. And there's so much to go into, but we, we no need to unpack it now. The point is, we all know that we are a product of the people around us. And when we change our environment with people who are dedicated to our well-being, they want goodness for us and guidance for us, then that's going to help us, prevent us from falling into shubahat. Number six, seek a specialist. The, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you don't know, ask the people of remembrance. Ask those who know. The Prophet said in a hadith, the cure to ignorance is to ask and learn. Don't think that you're going to know everything. We're limited human beings. We have ulama, we have uh, students of knowledge, we have specialists in our community. We just need to seek them and find them. And wallahi, I believe someone in the ummah has an answer. Whether it's a one person or a group of scholars, it exists. Don't think that we're better than them just because, you know, we're on YouTube and we have some following and we think we're rock stars now. Na'udhu billah. We should know our plates. We have very ex amazing specialist ulama. I've realized this myself through my own mistakes and through interacting with them. We are standing on their shoulders. We're standing on the shoulders of giants. And we have to respect them. And they have a lot of ilm and a lot of answers to very specific questions that we would not even think that they were able to answer this. So seek them and you would find them. Seek them, you would find them. There are specialists in our community. 
on different issues concerning science, concerning uh, uh, complicated questions, concerning society, com co concerning law, concerning history. We have our specialists, alhamdulillah. And one of the major problems of the dua today, they have a kind of disconnect with the ulama and they have a disconnect to the tradition. And because they've gone to a secular university, they think now I'm going to take all the answers myself. And then they have to go through all of the mistakes and then they realize I'm such an idiot. I should have spoken to this sheikh. He was a specialist. We need to learn to stay in our lane. We have to stay in our lane, brothers and sisters. But the point is, ask a specialist, number six. Number seven, focus on your qalb, on your heart, brothers and sisters. Remember what we spoke about in the beginning. The heart is central to this discussion. We have to strengthen the spiritual heart. So when shubuhat come, they bounce off. How do you strengthen the spiritual heart? You need to get closer to Allah. Minimum, you have to pray five times a day. Do your dua in the morning and the evening. The duas are on, on, uh, on protection, which we'll discuss a bit later. Your afgar, your dhikr in the morning and the evening. It's, you know, everything has a polish and the polish of the heart is the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It reflects the, the guidance of Allah, the, the mercy and so on and so forth. We have to engage in tadabbur of the Qur'an. Allah says in the Qur'an, Quran. Do they not reflect upon the Qur'an or are there locks on their hearts? In other words, you can mirror the meaning here. The more your heart becomes unlocked, the more you do tadabbur, the more your heart becomes unlocked to receive his guidance and mercy. If you don't do tadabbur, if you don't do pondering over the Qur'an, it becomes more locked with all these locks and it cannot uh, receive the guidance and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to engage in recitation of the Qur'an. It's a shifa. Understand its meanings, which is much more important, of course. It's critical. Allah wants you to be guided. Uh, you need to, you know, do tawbah, istighfar, repentance to Allah. It, 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 it prevents calamity. And what great calamity, The one of the greatest calamities to have shubuhat, destructive doubts about the deen. So give, uh, you know, do istighfar, do tawbah. It brings the mercy of Allah. Give sadaqah. So all of these things, tahajjud prayer, the night prayer, making dua in sajda. The Prophet said the closest you are to your Lord is in prostration. So prostrate to your Lord. So all of these spiritual tools we have according to the Quran and Sunnah to strengthen our spiritual heart, brothers and sisters. This is one of the most important ones. Yes, I did say this is not a roadmap. It's a toolkit. But you have to use this anyway. This is the one that you have to use irrespective of your context. Strengthen the spiritual heart. Number eight, brothers and sisters. Number eight is make dua. Make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dua is the weapon of the believer. Remember the often repeated dua of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is, oh, turn of hearts, turn your heart firm on my deen. Make your heart firm on my deen. Many of the duas in the Quran concerning you know, not being afflicted by, you know, shubuhat uh, or, 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 or not being certain in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about being firm and steadfast. Memorize these dua, these, 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 these supplications. And, and even from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For example, one that comes to mind, Raditu bilayhi rabban wa bi islami deen and wa bi muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and nabiyyan. You know, I am content with Allah as my Lord. With uh, the Islam as my deen and the Prophet as my as my messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And if you do this three times the morning, evening, according to the Hadith, that on the day of judgment you be content. Allahu Akbar. So what you need to realize is that you need to understand that du'a is a weapon of the believer, and supplicate them with sincerity and be specific. Because you know who you are talking to. It's the Lord of the heavens and the earth. He says, Kun, kun yakun. He says, be and it is. He has power over all things. And when you supplicate to him and it's accepted, then everything can change. Allah controls our hearts. We don't control our hearts. At the end of the day, we are utterly dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's of samad. He is the self-sufficient. He is al-ghani. He is the free. And we are utterly dependent on him. We are impoverished before Allah so we should we should seek his help because everything happens because of his irada and qudra everything happens because of his will and power so that was uh, number eight number nine critical thinking 
Many of the shubahat that come to us, brothers and sisters, because people don't like to think. And the Qur'an is a revelation that has taught us how to think. When you look at all of the ayat referring to nature, Allah gives us a conclusion. He wants us to reflect on the particular natural phenomenon, to make a conclusion about who we are, how we should relate to Allah and who Allah is. Allah is forcing a particular way of thinking. For example, what comes to mind when Allah talks about those who didn't want to accept the deen because they wanted to follow their forefathers. But Allah says to them, you're going to follow your forefathers even if they're upon falsehood, even if they were wrong. So we need to be able to be able to think critically, brothers and sisters. And I truly believe when we have a Quranic way of thinking, critical thinking, this will solve many of the shubahat and many of the doubts. So that was number nine. The last one, dealing with trauma. Allahu Akbar. Dealing with trauma is everyone has different traumas in their life. Whether it's negative experience with the religious people, negative experiences at home, ne negative experiences in general. It could be abuse. It could be big trauma like abuse. It could be small trauma like something else. The point is we all have traumas. And what happens in our lives is these traumas shape our understanding of how we look at the world. They become the lens in which we relate with others and relate to ourselves and even relate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we need to teach people is, yes, everyone's going to have certain traumas, whether they're big or small. We're going to have our own lenses in which we understand things, but we have to do this. And this, what, this is what cognitive science says as well. We have to stand in the possibility that the meaning you're giving this trauma is not the only meaning because trauma can lead to shubuhat sometimes. Because, you know, if we got troubled in a mosque one day, uh, we're like, oh, all religious people are the same, therefore Islam is false. That's not a true conclusion, but you've used that small trauma as a lens in order to understand Islam. So what we try and train people to do is stand in the possibility that the meaning you're giving their trauma is not the only meaning. And then through our conversation, we get them to give the meaning Allah wants them to have. And we see this in the Quran itself. Look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa alayhi salam and to the Prophet sallam in Surah Duha. The Prophet sallam was, was, had this kind of contextual, I don't know how to describe it, anxiety or contextual uh, depression even. And Surah Duha came down and look how Allah deals with him. Who guided you? You're an orphan. Who took care of you? Look at look at look at the look at the light of the day. Giving him good news, reframing his perception of his traumas. Even Surah Al Kawthar, Allahu Akbar, Surah Al Kawthar, a phenomenal surah. Think about it. The Prophet Sallam, he had so much. Yearning and love for the believers. No one could be as merciful as he was. Now imagine the mercy he had for his son. No one will claim the Prophet ﷺ had the same mercy as the mercy I have for my son or someone, someone else, or someone else's his son. Yeah, the Prophet had imagine the, the love that he had for, for for people. Imagine his own son, and his son passes away at early age. And all the Arabs are saying, Aptar, Aptar, he is cut off, he is cut off. The Prophet Sallam is still, you know, you can imagine almost holding the babe, the, the child in his hands, hasn't even buried him. And all of these Arabs are saying he's cut off, he's cut off. Imagine the anguish, the turmoil, or what was happening in his heart. And then Allah reveals Surah Al Kawthar, Allahu Akbar. To the degree where Allah doesn't even mention anything about his pain. He's, the, Allah is reframing the thinking of the Prophet ﷺ by saying, Indeed, verily, we have given you the abundance. And if you study the Arabic here, it's phenomenal. Inna kal Indeed, we, the majestic plural, we have given you. Atayna. And this word is very powerful because it doesn't mean just given, but the person that's giving you something, he owns and he's giving it with his own hand, which is more emphasis. In the beginning, you have the emphatic particle, inna, verily, unquestionably, we, with the, with the plural. And then you have, we, we have given you. So it's like saying, indeed, we, 
we have given you. And Atain here has this emphasis of giving with your own hand and the, the thing that you're giving you own. And then Allah says, Al Kalthar, Alif Lam, definite particle, the abundance. What is Al Kalthar? It's a river in paradise, but the ulama say there's a linguistic meaning as well. Al Kalthar, Kathara, Kathir, many things, plentiful things. But there is a wow. If you study the Arabic nuances, the wow indicates perpetuity and longevity. Just like the watawalso bil haq in the famous chapter of the Quran, you must continue to call to haq. It's not just once off. Watawalso, the wow in the watawalso means perpetuity, continuing. Likewise, in al kawtha the wow means we, ha- we are giving you the abundance. It's continuing. It's perpetual. And we know Allah gave the Prophet the abundance. Not only the highest level in paradise, He has the most believers on the Day of Judgment. He's the most praised person on this planet. Every microsecond, someone is saying, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Adhan is playing all the time, constantly 24 hours because of the tight changes in, in, because of the sun uh, and the rotation uh, uh, of the earth. Uh, it, 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 there's always Adhan playing. It's always Maghrib somewhere. It's always Dhuhr somewhere, right? And the Adhan is going off. And then mentioning Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the most off praised person. He was successful in the dunya and the akhirah. Even non-Muslims mention this about his inverted commas secular success, and we know his spiritual success too. So the point is, look at the reframing, and then Allah says, "For salli li Rabbika wanhar." Therefore, pray for salli li Rabbika wanhar to your Lord and sacrifice. So he's reframing. You've been given all of this abundance forever, continuing perpetually. Therefore, the way you should react to this is. Salah, pray to your Lord and sacrifice to Him. Allahu Akbar, getting Him to do actions, to express gratitude through worship. And what's interesting here, just from a nuance point of view, in the beginning of the surah, you have we, the majestic we, referring to Allah. But now it's Rabb, Fasalli li Rabbika wanhar. There is a shift in the pronoun. Why? Because it's about the emphasis and it's connected to the meaning of that particular verse. The first verse was, you know, verily we have given you. It's about we, majesty, ability. We have given you the abundance. The second verse is about intimacy. So the pronoun is changed from we to Rabb. For salli li rabbika wanhar. This is called iltifat in Arabic uh, balaga. It, moving from one direction to the other to enhance the message because it's in perfect place and harmony because Rabb is, is like tarbiya, the one that nurtures you, the one that loves you, the one that is taking care of you, your Lord who has affection for you. This is the kind of meaning of Rabb and therefore it's more connected to Salah, فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَنْهَا And then Allah says, indeed the one who hates you, he's the one who's truly cut off. And there's more nuances, but the point is, even just a shallow, quick understanding of just this chapter, Allah is reframing, changing the meaning of the trauma of the son of the person passing away. Changing it from trauma to ang- and anguish to gratitude and empowerment and, 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 and uh, a sense of I am receiving these perpetual uh, divine gifts. And this is just touching the service. Even when the Prophet talks about Musa alayhi salam and talks to him about, you know, who who basically inspired your mother to put you in the river and so on and so forth. That Allah is trying to change the meaning to our trauma. If you give the meaning that Allah wants you to give it, life is a test. Allah loves those who he tests and so on and so forth. Your trauma will change. And if your trauma changes the way you see shubahat will change and you're less likely to be infected by shubahat. Obviously, all of these strategies I mentioned is very, very quick summary. Read the book online that we've that we've suggested and also maybe attend the in-depth course, which is free on our learning platform. Go to sapiensinstitute.org. Jazakallah. Barakallahu feek, akhi. Inshallah, we'll, we'll ask our sheikh because he's official, or officially translating um, from... English to Serbian, so we'll ask him maybe to take take the 
books off your site and in short translate yeah, so the question about relativism you mentioned a question about relativism yeah yeah one, one brother said that he he used to have a lot of shubaha due to due to a philosophical view of, of relativism so if you maybe want to address it you in your last 10 minutes or, or, or yeah look i mean look it depends what he means by this but generally speaking when people are affected by relativism it's usually just from a kind of practical perspective, that they don't have a strong foundation in the Islamic Aqidah. I truly believe if someone, you know, studies the Islamic tradition, understands the Qur'an, understands Allah's names and attributes, why Allah is worthy of worship, there will be no room for relativism. Because when you study, for example, Tawheed, affirming the oneness of Allah, and you realize Allah is the only deity worthy of worship, and you understand why that is the case, and you start to understand why Allah is, is worthy of our love, utmost love, our, our utmost obedience. Uh, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we must direct all of our uh, acts of worship to Him alone, extensive praise and gratitude. When we start studying the Quran and the Islamic Aqidah and we realize these are fundamental truths, there's no space for relativism. This transcends relativism. So when people start to, when someone starts to study, Tawheed in this way, just spiritually and intellectually, the relativist uh, mindset is gone. And I think from experience, usually when they when they have that relativist mindset, is because they've been brought up into the tradition. They're very spiritual. They're connected, but they haven't gone through the kind of process of reaffirming what the fitra is already connected to or has an affinity to, which is Allah is worthy of worship, and so on and so forth. So when people go, they, they, they travel that journey, if you like, that spiritual, intellectual journey, it solves the problem. I, I, and this is my challenge. I challenge anyone on the planet to study Allah's names and attributes, to study why Allah is, is perfect, why He's worthy of our extensive praise and gratitude, why He's the only deity worthy of worship. Using the arguments in the Quran, I'm telling you, you do this, then... This solves your problem. I am saying this because I experienced this myself. In my book, The Divine Reality, I have a chapter on chapter 15 called Why Allah is Worthy of Worship. That's basically the gist of uh, the title. And I go through around seven reasons why Allah is worthy of worship. And just when I was going through that, it was such a life-changing process from the perspective of how you see yourself and how you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when someone studies why Allah is worthy of worship, they will know that worship is not only transactional. Allah is worthy of worship irrespective of what He's given me. Allah is worthy of worship because of who He is. And not necessarily because He has given us anything. Yes, he's he, he gives us blessings and many things and we should be grateful, which is a form of worship. However, fundamentally, if the whole universe and everything within it were not to worship Allah, Allah is still worthy of worship and he wouldn't decrease his majesty or bounty. If the whole universe were to worship Allah and everything within it, it would not increase his majesty or bounty. And yet he's still worthy of worship. He is worthy of worship because of who he is. And let me just give you a quick example. How many of us praise people all the time? We are compelled in our hearts to praise MMA fighters like Khabib or poets like the Pakistani India, the uh, subcontinent poet Iqbal. Or we like to praise um, athletes, or we like to praise our children, or we like to praise very smart scholars and human beings. Why do we praise these people? We are compelled within us to praise those things because they have some attributes that we believe are praiseworthy, even though their attributes do not directly benefit us in any way. But if we're compelled to praise our children, scholars, intellectual people, athletes, uh, martial artists, poets, nasheed singers, whatever the case may be, we, if we are compelled to praise them because of who they are, even though they have limited attributes and they, they, they don't directly benefit us in any way, then what does it mean about praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whose names and attributes are maximally perfect to the highest degree possible without any deficiency and flaw? Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater. And we know in Um Kitab Surah Al-Fatiha, Um Kitab is the summary of the whole of the Quran. And in the first line, what does Allah say? Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. All perfect praise and gratitude belong to Allah, 
the Lord of everything that exists. So when we frame it from a Quranic perspective, we know Allah is worthy of worship even if I didn't receive anything in the universe. He's worthy of worship because of who he is and not because of how he's decided to express his names and attributes in my life. Although he has given me benefits and blessings. Another example about Allah's names and attributes, about why Allah is worthy of worship, Allah is Al-Khaliq, the creator. He's Al-Khalaq, the perpetually creating. And frame it not from the perspective of Allah has given me a wife, or many wives, or Allah has given me children, or many children, or Allah has given me a big car house. Don't frame it that way. Frame it, you f- frame it from the perspective of something that you can't even buy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator. He created every conscious moment of our existence. Brothers and sisters, if you had 10 minutes left to live, but I said to you, in order to get another 10 days, you have to give me all of your wealth. You will give me all of, of all of your wealth just to get the other 10 days. That's how priceless the gift of life is. But life itself, every conscious moment, we don't earn, own, or deserve. We can't create a fly. We cannot create life. And so it's a priceless gift that Allah has given us. So if it's true that every moment of our existence, Allah gives us this priceless gift to us, how should it make us feel? We should be grateful, ultimately grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, ultimate gratitude is an expression of worship as per I've just mentioned concerning Surah Al-Fatiha. These are very small, quick examples just to make you realize when you start to engage with the Quran in the right way, you engage with Allah's names and attributes, you understand who you are and how you should relate to Allah. You understand who Allah is with regards to his maximal perfection, his names and attributes. I am telling you, relativism is dead. It's obliterated. It's not in your vocabulary. It's finished because it would affect you intellectually, spiritually, and the way you express yourself as a Muslim and as a human being. So this is a very important advice that I give all, to all of my brothers and sisters because sometimes in the Dawah, we get lost in argument. What did the Bible say? What did this say? What did Fulan say? Fulana say? All of these people. But Wallahi, brothers and sisters, the most important thing we should be focusing on as well. Yes, all of these things are important, especially in certain contexts. But we should always have the uh, eye on the biggest thing, the most, the strongest Quranic narrative, which is the Quran came down to talk to people about why Allah is worthy of worship fundamentally. And we should always remind people, and even if we talk about God's existence, connect it to this. Even if we talk about the Bible, connect it to this. Even if we talk about the personality of Isa alayhi salam, connect it to this. Always connected to this because this is something that is so affirming in your fitrah. It's so part of who you are. It makes sense rationally and intellectually. It satisfies your heart. And it's actually based on the most fundamental truth out there in the universe, which is la ilaha illallah. There is no deity worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. al ilah the deity. And this is very important, and we should start reviving a narrative on reflecting on the Quran in this sense, because most of the many of the ayat are about why Allah should be obeyed, why He should be praised, why we should be grateful to Him, why we should be in awe of Him, why we should believe He is the most perfect Creator, uh, we should affirm His perfect attributes, um, why we should have tawakkul on Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and so on and so forth. And all of this is about reflecting on ourselves, our limitations as human beings. And also reflect on Allah's names and attributes and who Allah is. And that would, would actually reaffirm that timeless truth that Allah is the only deity worthy of worship. I would just add something small, just to simplify it. Of course, uh, it please. Can't be, it can't be relative because we are dependent. If you depend on something, it's not relative. You can't claim relativism. Then if it's relative, then just stop breathing, stop eating. You are so dependent on every single thing. So if you're already physically dependent, why why shouldn't you be spiritually? So just just very, very, to simplify things. So my dear brothers, um, I'm going to call it a night from this perspective. Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless every single one of you. Um, I would would definitely love to come on again. I know that sounds a bit weird because you don't get speakers saying, uh, please put me back on because it sounds a bit no, arrogant. Bro, bro, there's no, there's but, no, there's no, there's no, there's no, our, our, our honor. No, but I'm, but I'm telling you why because uh, the way I try and teach the du'at and myself is that we consider these these things as a blessing for us 
you have given me the opportunity. I'm thanking you for the opportunity because we are miskeen. Because in the da'wah, we have to realize Allah doesn't need us. This is a gift. If iman is a gift, as you mentioned earlier in chapter 49, verse 17, then imagine calling others to iman. It's a compounded gift. It's a double gift. It's something that Allah does not need us. Allah is mm-hmm. of samad. He's al ghani Allah has just given us the opportunity and he could take it away in a moment. And there is nothing special about me or anyone that we think we deserve this position. No. Mm-hmm. So I want you to understand it from the perspective of when, when this is a great opportunity. I'm thankful to you for this opportunity. And we want more of these opportunities because we want Allah's uh, 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 forgiveness and, uh, and and the mercy of Allah and the fact that Allah is using us, using this this miskeen sinner to even talk about who Allah is and how we should uh, relate to Him. And that's why I want you to frame it not from the position of I want platform. I'm being I'm begging for Allah's mercy. So therefore, I'm begging. Inshallah, we'll do this again. Inshallah, you move me, mashallah. What can I say, brother? The only one thing will probably try to record next time uh, because most of our audience it, it, it tuned out, they don't understand us, so they'll, they'll be waiting for, for translation, so maybe next time we record it and then yes. we, 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 you know, no problem. we put it on no as problem. a premiere, uh, so something like that no but problem, we'll, we'll and speak about logistics you just check me when you have time when, when, what, how's your schedule we'll, we'll plan something so, Inshallah, Habibi we'll so, uh uh, Sheikh uh, Khidr, may Allah bless you. Uh, Omar, may Allah bless you. Uh, Sheikh, uh, khaira, brother. Fe, uh, Sheikh uh, uh, Rad, Radonjic. Faiz, Faiz, Faiz. Don't worry about uh, my, my name. May Allah bless you, Sheikh. And uh, Habibi, khaira, Ali, Marulakis. Really uh, Nasagala, Fadabume, Sindoma, Daxi. Arabic, uh, Sidiya. Okay, Oh, Oh, Oh,